It's the final countdown. We are just three days away from polling day and finding out who has won the general election of 2024. But have Nigel Farage, Sue Ella Bravman and TV debates been the big losers of the seven-week yawn fest of a campaign? We'll also be checking out what's happening in France and talking of television debates, reflecting on that disastrous performance from Joe Biden in his head-to-head with Donald Trump last week. Welcome to the Downtown Den Politics Podcast. Uh, My friends sort of used to run through the fields of wheat. uh, You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Uh, They will, it will cost. Um, I know words, I have the best words, but there's no better words than stupid. Okay, as ever during this general election campaign, I'm delighted to be joined in the den today by Joe Phillips, former advisor to Paddy Ashdown, and Jim Hancock, the downtown and business political commentator. And it has been, I think, a fairly uninspiring seven week general election campaign, Joe. We are still expecting, according to all the polls, a Labour victory on Thursday, but we will come back to that. I wanted to focus on perhaps who've been the big losers of the campaign. And I'm surprised to be saying that I think a big loser of the past seven weeks, certainly the past couple of weeks, is Nigel Farage. He made this faux pas in relation to the Ukraine war and uh, Vladimir Putin. And since then, he appears to have lost his mojo a bit, hasn't been as confident, hasn't been as forthright in some of the comments he's made. And then, of course, reform have discovered, surprise, surprise, that some of their candidates are racists and have made some racist comments, anti-Semite comments and remarks. And then Channel 4 did this tremendous sort of fly on the wall undercover documentary about reform candidates and found one or two two of them saying very, very impolite things. Uh, It turns into a bit of a joke, haven't they, Joe? It's not been a great campaign for Nigel and co. Oh, I think he has had far more publicity than reform deserves. Um, He's been on the television, on the radio, in the papers, far more than the Greens and the Liberal Democrats. Um, he's an expert at making himself the centre of the story. Um, and he's also expert at blaming everybody else when it goes wrong. It's yeah. straight out of the Trump playbook. I think, and you may think that I am completely bonkers and it's a conspiracy theory, but I think it would suit Nigel Farage quite well to lose Clacton by a few hundred votes to be within touching distance, but blame it on everybody else, the woke BBC, people like us, all the commentators, Channel 4, then he doesn't have to deal with constituency matters and he can go off to America. So I think he has played this. He's played the public for fools. He's played the people of Clacton for fools. Um, and I think the media have been too much in thrall to him. I would absolutely agree, as you won't be surprised to hear, uh, with your comments about this media obsession with Farage. Uh, and I would still say... James, that the BBC are the worst culprits as far as that's concerned. However, I do think that Farage saw this election campaign as the catalyst for a emergence of a reform reverse takeover of the Conservative Party. And I think the past fortnight, some of the comments that have been made by him personally, but also from these characters who have been candidates for the Reform Party, have actually given conservatives, some conservatives, a bit of steel. And more of them now are coming out and saying there is no room in our party for people like Nigel Farage. We do not want to go down the route of a reform agenda. And that's why I lumped Sue Ella Braverman into the losers, because she was the one who was certainly making the most positive overtures to Farage prior to the election. She was saying, you know, I can't see why Nigel shouldn't be part of our party moving forward. Joe had actually suggested before the election was called, 
earlier than we anticipated, the Bravham and Maywell defect to reform. So that's why I've lumped her in with the sort of losers of, of, of this campaign. Jim, what do you make of it? Do you think that Farage has blown it as far as that realignment of the right as people have been calling it is concerned? And um, not not completely, uh, because uh, we'll probably discuss this later on about what I see as parallels between what's happening in France and Britain as far as the centre right party is concerned. But um, I think he made, you know, he has sort of explicitly said that he wants to be, you know, in contention to be prime minister in 2029. So I'm not sure I agree with Joe that he wants to lose and then go off to America. Um the other things I want to say about him are is that I saw a poll the other day which had all the contenders for the leadership of the Conservative Party uh, amongst, you know, asking the general public. And Farage was the favourite to lead the Conservative Party. I mean, that's partly a comment on the alternatives, I suppose. Um, uh, he made an interesting point about how he'd you know, when he was accused of um, flirting with racists, saying, I smashed the BNP. The trouble with that is that he possibly did, but people with the unsavoury opinions that used to support the BNP are attracted to reform. And that's one of the big problems he's got. And the last thing is, in our continuing <laughs> spats about the BBC, I maintain that they are, in terms of their formal appearances by reform on all their programmes, they will be meticulously working out what share they should get compared to others. However, on top of that fairness, which I think has been observed, you always get this news value. Now, and this is where we can have the debate. You say, with some justification, that Farage creates news events that we are then forced to report upon. But, you know, there is an element of news that has to be reported over and above equal treatment for the political parties. Which is no, true, said, Jim, but, yeah, on, yeah. but it, it doesn't always have to be Nigel Farage. And the broadcasters are perfectly at liberty to say, actually, we want Ben Habib or we yeah. want Richard Tice or we want your spokesperson on X, Y, Z. The fact that it's just him um, and he's a good media performer means that I that's why I think it's so disproportionate. You know, he's had a lot more right. coverage. It's the Nigel Farage party. Yeah. And the, I think the broadcasters are perfectly within their rights. They know we need to hear some other voices. I mean, to be fair to the BBC, Jim, it was Nick Robinson during that sort of longer television interview with who drew him out. Uh, and he made that comment about the Ukraine war during that half hour interview with Robinson. So the BBC need to be given credit for that. But he did say in his last interview with Beth Rigby that he will not join the Conservative Party. He's got no intention of doing so. And I do think that's because so many mainstream Conservatives now have come out and said, no, we're, we're just not having it. Uh, so I think he's blown it. I do think he's blown it. I think he will be disappointed. I don't know if you've seen this um, on your social media channels, but uh, Led by Donkeys did this fabulous, um, well, they, they basically hijacked his rally, didn't they? His final, I think it was his final rally, somewhere in, in the south. It may have been in Clacton. And he's speaking. Did you see this, guys? No. So he's talking to his... Uh, his disciples and as he's speaking behind him this poster starts to lower and lower and lower and lower and there's a massive photograph of Vladimir Putin with the comment I love Nigel <laughs> <laughs> and then it's taken them like five or ten minutes to get this bloody thing down off the stage. A wonderful, wonderful moment of the campaign. Yeah, it's 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 right that you raise the Ukraine because I think we agree that there have been two major issues for uh, reform in the last week or so, uh, which has led to a slight softening in their vote. Uh, one is the racism thing, which we've discussed, but the other thing is that Ukraine thing because uh, you know the sort of people that Farage attracts are generalizations but you know they're generally very patriotic um and quite sort of um you know like to defend the underdog sort of thing and ukraine appeals to them and um you know farage's analysis which incidentally i've got some quite left-wing friends uh who actually 
and I haven't heard from them in the last week or so, but on the on the sort of left on the left, on the sort of what we might describe as the Corbyn left, actually sort of sort of agree with it. You know, that but this idea that Ukraine in some way provoked or the NATO or EU provoked Putin, I think that has been a, a real, real challenge for some of Farage's natural supporters. Yeah, it's I think that's right, Jim. I think that I think that uh, the Ukraine uh, comment has done him far more damage than the racism, and that may may say more about his voters than it says about anything else. Sorry, Joe, I interrupted you. No, well, only to say that it, I think the Ukraine comments gave the Tories. Um, the opportunity to attack yeah. reform, which, I mean, we've discussed before, why were they letting them walk all over them? And I think that, you know, you've seen a bit more steel, a bit more oomph from the toys directed at everybody, but they finally worked out that they need to attack reform. Um, and I think we've even had Oliver Dowden saying that, you know, Russia is behind reform yesterday. Yeah. Which is, you know. Yeah, I wonder whether the Tories are now reflecting on the campaign and thinking they should have gone for them earlier because it's certainly into the vote and it is a bit too little, too late. I do I have to say, I heard cleverly having a, a pop at reform and it was all very sort of kid glove stuff. You know, it was, oh, Nigel, oh, Nigel. You know, it's just pathetic, absolutely pathetic. And, of course, this is because... Going back to your point, Jim, their base, you know, the people out there in the country who are Conservative Party members actually do play into the reform agenda by and large. That's why Liz Truss was elected as leader over Rishi Sunak. You know, the members never selected Rishi Sunak. They went for Truss. And so, although I do think that the idea of Farage now, as I say, doing that reverse takeover of the Conservative Party, which I am sure was his key objective when he went into this campaign, is now off the table. I do still see potentially a big split within the Tory party in the right after the election. And that would sort of follow the pattern of what's happened elsewhere. And people have been talking about you know, the meltdown that the Canadian Conservatives suffered back in the 90s, it took them a decade to recover. And they eventually did come together with the party over there, which is called Reform, um, ironically. So we will wait and see what happens as far as that's concerned. But now I don't think it's been the sort of campaign, despite all of the comments that Joe made in terms of media coverage and profile and so on and so forth. I don't think it's quite been the campaign that Farage wanted. And I think you're absolutely right, Joe, if he wins Clacton, then that just puts the ice on the cake for what has been a not particularly great seven weeks for Nigel. He's going to have to be in Clacton every Friday night when he could have been partying with Donald Trump in the run-up to the presidential election. There you go. Let's come back to the TV debates then. And I was really, really disappointed with all of them, I have to say. And I wrote my blog about this last week. People have sort of misunderstood it, some people, I think, in saying, oh, yeah, the two candidates were poor. That wasn't the point I was making. The point I was making was it wouldn't really have mattered. You'd have had, let's say, Blair and Johnson up there. It still would have been a poor format. They were simply not given the space, the room to discuss ideas, to put forward the case, to be interrogated in a serious manner. Uh, and again, I, I'm going to sound so anti-BBC, and I am not. I promise you I am not. But the worst question of all the debates that was allowed to be put was that prat of a guy who stood up and said, oh, are you two shithouses the best that we can do? Or words to that effect. And to compound, putting that sort of question to the two candidates to be Prime Minister of our country. The BBC then say in the newscast afterwards, here was the question of the night. What an absolute joke. So we didn't have homelessness discussed. We didn't discuss education, the Middle East. But you allow this absolute wanker who's just trying to make a bit of a name for himself to stand up and put that sort of question to Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. And whatever you think of those two guys, right, they are not bad people, they are certainly not dumb, and they are not the worst choice that we've ever had 
in an election campaign. Jim, again, I have to ask you, who in the right mind at the Beeb thinks that that was a reasonable question to be chosen to put to those two prime ministerial candidates? Um, in the United States and in the United Kingdom, one of the themes of the concurrent elections is that people wish that other people were the leading candidates for office. And in a way, that question from that gentleman... Um, Don't be calling him a gentleman. Area. He was an absolute prat. Well, I saw he was... Well, to compound your anger, I don't know if you watched the spin room afterwards, but he was a special guest in the spin room uh, of, 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 um, of Laura Kunzberg. Um, I, I do think... Uh, you know that the exploration of uh, of how this sort of millionaire um, Asian oh, businessman on, has become leader of the Jim, Conservative Party Jim, and please. this former lawyer has become leader of the Labour Party oh. uh, and and whether they are inspirational and they are truly politicians, I think that's an area for discussion. Don't be daft. You basically what you're saying is that you are trying to make British politics follow in every sense of the phrase, the American way. And we are taking our political debate into the area of entertainment. And that's all that was about. It was right, about well, let, let, let's, let's, let's gently it move the discussion. Yeah, okay. It let, was let, about but, satisfying a very small number of audience watching it. Because I have to tell you, Jim, the comment that... I made about that particular gentleman, as you call him, and his question, the number of people who came back to me on social media following my blog last week and said, you're absolutely right, Frank. What a disgrace that the BBC, of all media platforms, allowed him to put that question. Joe, do, what do you think? I think the television debates have been diabolical. I think we have learnt nothing. I think um, that... And it's not just the BBC, although I do happen to agree with you about that particular comment and the way it was then spun. And I think this whole thing about trying to turn it into entertainment and involving an audience is dumbing down of the worst thing. I mean, isn't it interesting? We've just been talking about the Nigel Farage interview, a longer form interview yeah. with Nick Robinson of the BBC. You know, there was a time and people might not want to see this anymore, but the people who are interested would probably learn more from an Andrew Neil interview with Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer or Nigel Farage or Ed Davey or whoever it is, where it is done by somebody who has got no axe to grind but has done some research. We've had, these debates have been so shallow, you'd barely get your feet wet. You know, they haven't talked about <laughs> social care, they haven't talked about foreign policy, they haven't talked about so many things. And they've allowed politicians to talk over each other to talk over the the women who were chairing all of the debates, I think, which is disgusting. Um, they've ended up with party leaders trying to get a sound bite out and us going off down these rabbit holes of £2,000 tax or the yes. boats or, you know, and you just think this is not telling anybody anything. And it's not going to help people who are perhaps not as engaged in politics as we are to learn anything because it's just like you know it's just like a bloody pub argument right well uh, I, we're, we're, I, we're, I, we're, we're, we're getting into dangerous territory here so the vulgar public mustn't be allowed in we must must have in, in no, intelli intelligentsia that. like andrew neil debating with these people and we mustn't let the general public put their questions jim I mean, do you it, want people to be educated or entertained during a political campaign now for yeah. me that is the question and this idea that you know, you, you can either be a leader or a follower. So if you're saying, well, look, people like Johnson and people like Farage and people like Rees Mogg and people like GB News, who class themselves as an entertainment channel, by the way, we're going to allow them to basically dictate how we do politics in this country. And I'm suggesting, Jim, that you can either influence the public in the way that they view politics and politicians, or you just say, OK, we'll allow it all to be done down. And it started with Brexit and it ends up with a newscaster saying to Rishi Sunak in the first debate on ITV, Prime Minister, 
the NHS is in a right mess. Tell us how you're going to fix it. And you've got 45 seconds. It's an absolute and utter joke. And if I was the political leaders of both parties, main parties, going into the next election, I would absolutely refuse to do those head-to-head debates. And I would open myself up to those more serious interviews, as Joe suggested. They were a waste of time. And the ordinary viewer, by the way, Jim, didn't watch them. Like they were watching Emmerdale or Coronation Street or something else. Because after 10 minutes... Even the most politically of interested people, myself included, couldn't bear to watch. It was so curlingly embarrassing. And I have to say, Jim, if you are defending that sort of approach to our politics, then I'm afraid, no, it's not the public that are the problem. It's people in the media who think our public are stupid. No, well, I just want to clarify that you see no place for in the future, um, audience-based debates between the principal people wanting to be prime minister. I'm, I'm not saying this in a hostile way. I just want to clarify that no. you think it's better to have long-form interviews with... I mean, gosh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a hu- have a huge appetite for long-form interviews. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a son of Brian Walden, Robin Day. I love that sort of format, and I think there's a case for it. I just want to clarify what your two positions are, that we should not have the public involved. Because if you have the public involved, they submit questions, and then there's, there is filtering of it, and somebody chose the question from the gentleman you know that that's what happens but you know it is, different, it is it is it is a different it is a different dynamic i just want to clarify what you two actually want well, to see I in think the future but it's the format it's fine to have people asking questions of the leader but not two of them together um because you end up with they're not answering the public and i think you know the phone in programs which i mean you and i cut our teeth on Jim that actually is a much better format where people call in you haven't got the you know all the complicated architecture of television you know Mrs Trellis can call in and ask a question it's straightforward and you've got a presenter whether it's Nick Ferrari or or, um, Nicky Campbell or whoever it is is the moderator but when you've got the general public asking a question of both people the both people are not talking to the questioner. They're talking o- over each other. So as it's the format that's wrong. It's not about involving the public. But the public gain nothing from listening to the public not being answered by two people arguing with you. Now, other. Frank will tell us whether it's appropriate to raise this now, because we were going to talk about France and there are parallels with Britain. No, not yet. Not OK, yet, well, but with the United I, States... I, 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 no, no, but, no, but with the United just, States debate, you had yeah, muted but, microphones and no audience with Biden and Trump. That's how they dealt with it last week. But but again, I think, you know, there's. I would say no to debates between candidates because we do not elect presidents in this country. We elect governments. So unless you are going to put head to head with the chancellors, head to head with the health ministers, head to head with the education ministers, then it makes no sense to me. And if you are going to have that sort of, as I say, entertainment rather than political information and education then i'd rather forego the opportunity of seeing that sort of spat and that's what it became arguably the two best debates were those that really followed joe's format as closely as you possibly could so that was the one sky did with beth rigby where she had both of the candidates on separately and did a sort of 20 minute interrogation herself before she went to questions from the audience. And then the question time uh, debate where all the leaders were on. The problem I had with the question time debate was again, it plays into this, let's entertain and let's make all the, all the leaders look a little bit like a, a bit of a, a dickhead, if, 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 for want of a better phrase, because at the end of every answer, she goes back to the person who's asked the question, were you satisfied with that answer? And guess what? The answer is always no. And, and again, how do you get a, a Keir Starmer to answer the complex issue of how are you going to sort immigration out in two minutes? It just can't be done. So for me, I don't think it's good for democracy. I don't think it's good television. So I would knock it on the head. And I'd remind you, Jim, up until 2010, was it? We never had television debates in this country. It's a very new phenomenon. And I don't think it's ever worked. 
I think all the evidence shows that it doesn't move the dial anyway. And it just makes, I think, the undermining of our politics accelerate. I just don't think it's good for politics. I don't think it's good for the leaders. So for me, I would scrap them. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I'm just gently moving the agenda on. Of course, a lot of young people, and it, it's it's perhaps a little bit difficult for us with our age profile to understand this, but I'm, I'm trying to keep across it. Uh, the young people uh, are debating this election and there is seems to be quite a high level of involvement on TikTok and things like that. But they're all very short clips. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 and and so, you know, your desire for long form interviews, I, I'm not sure that our younger uh, voters will actually consume that sort of thing. But like the long like the debate, in a sense, the long form interviews then turn into the clips, don't they? Exactly. And so Nick Robinson didn't have an audience of 50 million for his interview, but that clip <clears throat> of Farage saying what he said ended up on all the newscasts, ended up on all the Twitter feeds, and that's how you sort of get your audience engaged through those smaller clips. Yeah, the all long, I'm saying is... The longer, that... the longer form interviews will only be watched by the people who, I would argue watch the whole of those debates yeah all, all i was responding to was your complaint which i fully understand to ask someone to explain their nhs policies in 45 seconds is is ludicrous on the other hand <laughs> what what they say will be clipped to about 45 seconds mm -hmm. uh, to be consumed by people in the tiktok generation but yeah. it's, it's very difficult but i i do take the beth rigby format idea i think that's possibly a compromise between what we've been talking about today i yeah, think that's I think, I think TV executives will have a long, hard look at audience viewing figures and reaction um, to all the debates. And I think the format is too clunky. It's not it's not fluid enough and smart enough to appeal to what Jim says is the sort of the TikTok audience. Um, but it's not sensible enough or detailed enough to appeal to people who want a more serious interview. So there has to be something in between. And I sort of think radio is better than television in a lot of ways. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the, the other thing I'd say, okay, in defence of the television executives, is they were probably caught on the hop in terms of the early election campaign. They were probably thinking, well, we've got until the autumn to think about how we're going to put these programmes together. And then it didn't look to me as though the party political managers had had much in a say in the formats either. If they did, then they want shooting as well because to say anybody who's agreeing to a format that allows you to give a 45 second answer to some of these very complex complicated issues is just daft so now for me you know playing on all your houses in a sense and uh, i do should say um because it deserves some commentary i suppose i thought soon i performed better um format poor though it was Sunak got to grips with the format much better than Keir Starmer did. Um, but again, it goes back to how, how important these things are because it doesn't appear to have moved the dial uh, at all. Um, listen, we've, we've talked about Farage, the right wing, and we've talked about the television debates there, the people who I think have, have been losers of this campaign. Um, before we close the first part of this episode, can I just ask you if you're sensing any shift i've said there wasn't a shift in the polls but you sensing any shift in terms of the mood of either the conservative or labor camp jim i think we're seeing great nervousness in the labor camp uh, the ming vase <laughs> perhaps our last mention of the ming vase is nearly across the ballroom but my goodness when i see labor spokespeople they are nervous of a last week drop, you know, a sort of 1990, not circumstances are different, but, you know, what happened in 1992 between the Sheffield rally and what actually happened with John Major's victory. I, I'm not saying that's remotely going to happen, but they're, they're, that's still in the psyche of older members of the Labour Party. And I, I think they're really, they're really anxious about either people thinking it that it's, it's, it's not, not, no need to vote because uh, it's gonna, they're going to get in anyway, so I don't need to bother. Or, you know, as you said, Sunak, as I said in my blog this week, I, I, he did perform a little bit better in this remorseless stuff from the Tory press. I mean, you know, the irony of the situation where Labour have 
exasperated some of their supporters by the limitations on their ambitions. But it hasn't stopped the Tory papers <laughs> with the onslaught about the taxes you're going to put yeah. up. So I think there there is a nervousness that something could go wrong. I mean, there, there is a sense now there's a bit of a problem for Labour. The expectation level of their huge majority and authority to govern, uh, anything that sort of falls short of a, of a mega majority, there's going to be sort of a, a sense of disappointment or that they haven't got... A, I've heard that talk coming up in the last few days. So, uh, you know, I mean, the, the message from Labour is is do get out and vote because they have this folk memory of it, of it not... Of it not happening in the past. Mm. All that being said, Jimmy, you're still expecting Keir Starmer to be in number 10 by Friday? Yes, I am. But I, I've done a, a private family sweepstake where I've said 200. And I think um, I think yours is a more sensible forecast. I think you're, you're thinking around 80. I think about between 60 and 80, which, you know, if we just said that five years ago, people would have been laughing at me, to be mm-hmm. fair. So, but you're right, Jim. People are now expecting the other way. You know, it's, it's bizarre. Joe, what are you thinking? Um, I'm thinking exactly what you've said about the Tory press. It's astonishing, although, as I said on a radio interview yesterday, they're talking about 100 days for Keir Starmer to ruin the country. Well, that's twice as long as Liz Truss had, and she did it in 49 <laughs> days. Um, so, you know, I do, my biggest concern is people not voting for two reasons one is apathy because they're bored to death but the other one and this is what I sense more than any other election I think I can remember people are really conflicted about who to vote for they want to vote tactically they want to make the right choice but they are torn um you know with so many things either because they're not sure about Keir Starmer or they hate the Tories or they don't want to let the greens in or whatever it is and then you hear people going oh they're all rubbish i'm not going to bother like i'm going to boycott it and you want to take them by the scruff of the bloody neck and say boycotting an election is not like boycotting a pub it won't close down because you're not going there they will (laughs) carry on without you so you know grow some get out there and vote even if you write on the voting slip, none of the above. There was a wonderful story, and um, Jim probably knows this anyway, uh, from some years ago that I can't remember which election it was, but the Liberal Democrat candidate actually was elected. It might have been a council election because so many people had written wanker, wanker, wanker on the polling slip, except against the Liberal Democrat. So they got elected. <laughs> 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 I remember, Joe. One of our counters, because just let me explain to listeners who are not as au fait with the way in which election counts work. Each party is allowed to have uh, counting agents, we call them. They watch as the people who are counting the votes are going through them to make sure that there are no discrepancies. So if you are a Labour counting agent, you are challenging anything that goes into, let's say, the Conservative pile that you think should have gone gone into the Labour pile, if the X is a bit ski whiff or whatever. And I was the agent in the 90, I think it was the 92 election this, the first time I've been a general election agent. And one of the counting agents is waving over along with the returning officers, the chief executive councillor who I knew very well. And I goes over and somebody had drawn quite an obscene image within the box of the Labour candidate and we were arguing that that was actually a vote for us (laughs) (laughs) and the counting agent who I should say at this point was female said well it's very large so it's not necessarily (laughs) criticism of our candidates (laughs) anyway the, the returning the returning officer did not accept our argument and that was put in the spoiled ballot pile of papers um so there you go some <laughs> great uh, yes yeah, some a lot of other stories that I, I couldn't possibly repeat on a family podcast actually as far as cancer concern um so joe you, you're expecting a labor majority still i think I'm expecting a Labour majority, but I mean, right now, I feel slightly sick and rather anxious um, because I think the Tories have had a bit of a fight back. I think the onslaught of the press is going to get even worse in the next three days. I think it's very significant that the Sunday Times came out for Labour. 
Uh, it's not surprising that the Guardian Observer and the Independent have come out for Labour, but the Sunday Times is a big hitter. Um, and I think that there is everything to play for and everything to lose between now and 10 o'clock on Thursday night. Um, but yeah, I think Labour will win. I think the Tories probably won't do as badly as they think, but they will lose some big names. And I think the Liberal Democrats will do quite well. And I think the SNP will virtually disappear. And that's significant because what happens then is that you change what happens in Parliament um, because then other people get a say, uh, an automatic right to ask questions and things at Prime Minister's questions. So that will change how it shapes our politics and who we hear from in the coming years. Yeah, the onslaught of the press attacks has been quite oh, remarkable, been really. Yes. And yeah. the other thing, I mean, the most bizarre thing is the Tories trying to get people to forget that we have elections every five years. Mm. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. if Keir Starmer wins a landslide, he's in for 20 years. It's like, yeah. how, how does that happen? Well, you know, this has been arguably six... got a landslide. He didn't last yeah. three. Yes. So this idea that Labour get a big majority and they're in for a generation, well, it totally misrepresents how our parliamentary democracy mm. works. It's yeah. been scandalous. I, I, the, the newspaper, of course, that hasn't, uh, come out in favour of anyone yet and you know we get almost shot in Liverpool for mentioning the word the sun um, but nevertheless it whole, it's always been seen as the bellwether newspaper hasn't it as yeah. far as elections concerned now my view of this is that the sun has always been quite clever in terms of instinctively knowing where the country was going and therefore backing that particular party and at the end of it saying it was the sum what won it. Um, but this time, they've not come out in favour of a political party yet. And I just wonder, Jim, whether they are going to go all Liberal Democrat on us and sit on the fence this time around. <laughs> yes, I would have thought they would have declared by now um, to, to be effective. And uh, I, I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, the only thing I want to say is that we mustn't overemphasize the importance of newspapers now. Yeah. I was listening to David Yellen, the former yeah. editor of The Sun, uh, from the 1990s and he was admitting that uh, the, the golden days where everyone was waiting with bated breath to see what the press were going to say is is is, is long gone i mean it, t it tends to influence the um, chattering classes and the, the broadcast media read the papers avidly but i think it's been a diminishing of that but uh, nevertheless you know it gives keir starmer a warm feeling if the sunday times comes out for him it, it's not it's not a hindrance to him so we'll yeah. we'll have to see what the um, the despicable son does Although it was interesting that Pat McFadden yesterday on LBC was asked the question, would you welcome the son's endorsement? And he immediately said yes. There was no hesitation, you know. So it's still something that our senior politicians take note of, even if perhaps the voters don't. So we will see. We'll see which way the scum, sorry, the, the sun falls in, in terms of the, this uh, election. Um, and uh, yes, I'm still, as you said, Jim, you know, I think a majority of between 60 and 80 would, would be what I'd be looking at for Thursday. If it's any more than that, I'd be surprised. If it's any less than 60, then, of course, you start getting into the territory of having to deal with your headbangers and your awkward squad. So Starmer would want something north of 60, I think. Whether in the cold light of day, he will see 60 to 80 actually as a far more positive majority than 180. Yeah. I, I'd suggest he would, because for me, you can have unmanageable political parties as well. And I always remind people within the Labour Party that the most disciplined group that I was part of came when I was first elected to the County Council, Lancashire County Council in 1989, and we had a majority of one. And that won, actually, we won the Ormskirk seat, Joe, by four votes. Mm. Um, and we had a majority of one for four years. We did not lose a vote. We had absolutely no dissent. The discipline was wonderful. By the end of my tenure on Lancashire County Council, I think we had about a majority of about 15 or 16. And it was far more difficult yeah. to keep well. people on side. The devil makes work for idle hands. And if you've got too many people sitting around with nothing to do, you've got trouble brewing.
Absolutely, absolutely. Right, well, with that, we will turn our attention in the second part of this episode to all things international, the French elections and Joe Biden's performance in the head-to-head debate with Donald Trump last week. Stick with us, we'll be back in a moment. Hi, this is Frank McKellar, the Chief Executive Group Chair of Downtown in Business. I'm delighted to announce that uh, in association with the Northern Power Towns organisation, we're organising a very special conference, Birchwood in Warrington, on Friday the 12th of July, looking at that very subject, focusing on Northern Power Towns, how we get our towns economically growing, how our towns can contribute to UK PLC. There'll be about 20 local authority executives in the room. We've got private sector partners from across the north of the country coming into the room and contributing too. So if you want to be with us for that conference, it's free to attend. Go to our website, that's all the W's, downtownandbusiness.com, to the events section and have a look at that Northern Power Towns conference, 12th of July, Warrington, and register your place today. Welcome back to the second part of this week's Downtown Den Political Podcast, our final podcast before we go to the polls on Thursday for the general election. But we're going to turn our attention for now to international affairs. And the first round of voting for the French election took place over the weekend. Let me explain again to listeners who are perhaps not as up to date with what happens abroad in terms of elections as we are um the french election they have two rounds of voting so in the first round all the candidates go forward and then in the second round which takes place next week um they basically siphon off the two top candidates and they have a runoff between those candidates now my understanding jim is that in round one uh the former national front now known as national rally Uh, led by Marine Le Pen, the right-wing political party in France, have done particularly well. Yes, um, the figures roughly are national rally about 34%. Uh, The left alliance, which is everything from sort of soft left social democrats right the way through to the communists, uh, got about 28%. And the Macron group, who were this party that he created of the sort of the centre of of French politics, uh, was down around... Uh, 20%. Now, the key thing in this, this is a bit complicated. The key thing is that in all these departments, I think there are about 600 of them. Um, the question is whether, uh, because if if a third party, this is normally a runoff between two, as you say, but if a third party got 12.5% of the vote, there could be three candidates in these constituencies. And what is crucial here is whether the left and the Macron group can decide that only one of them goes forward against uh, the national rally in next weekend's poll. And in that way, um, this sort of collaborating that usually goes on in France to keep the far right out can actually happen. If the Macron group and the left alliance continue to squabble, and don't reach agreement, and and as I understand it, it will be down to each département to decide this, then you know there could be three candidates, and then national uh, um, rally can 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 prevail. But if they're up against one candidate, sort of representing the left alliance and the Macron group, then they possibly can be defeated. But you know we we need to mark that um, you know arguably one of the, well the most significant country in Europe uh, is potentially going to have a far right government for the first time since Marshal Pétain led the Vichy uh, government during the Nazi occupation of the Second World War. And this was a decision, the reason we're having a, an election, I should uh, explain, is because uh, President Macron, following the European elections, in which his party did particularly badly, decided, right, I'm going to have a general election and see if this is what people really think, uh, believing, of course, that the European elections were simply a protest vote. Well, he's been given his answer in no uncertain terms, Joe, and it's not the one he wanted. 
No, and it's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, I know there is this saying that all political careers end in failure, but Macron's is particularly rapid um, because he emerged out of nothing, started this new party, um, was the golden wonder kid um, of, of Europe, if you like, and now people absolutely hate him. Um, and to call an election like that in what looks like a fit of peak, but right in the middle of the Olympic Games yeah. seems bonkers, yeah. frankly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just simply on terms of logistics and, and organisation. And whether or not he can mobilise his own people or whether, as Jim has explained, you know, they are prepared to, to stand back and let the sort of the left alliance move in. I mean, one would like to think that the French people, however cross and fed up they are with all sorts of things, will actually say no to having this far right um, movement. But unfortunately, we're seeing the rise of the right right across Europe. And if, you know, this time next week, we've got a Labour government in Britain, we will actually be outliers um, mm. because we will have a, a, a left of centre government against a lot more right wing governments um, across the rest of Europe. Yeah, I think the, the Macron sort of rise and fall story is, is quite a journey he's been on isn't it and you know if you listen to what businesses are saying um, from France and people who are involved in French business they are absolutely wetting themselves at the prospect of either a left-wing sort of socialist-led government or indeed uh, a national rally government because both of them are actually offering very populist policies which include for example, I'm just picking this out as one because people will understand this, leaving the retirement age at 60. And of course, what that does is it costs the country an absolute fortune because just like Britain, you know, it's an ageing population and that budget for pensions has grown and grown and grown. So the economy is not performing particularly well. Macron, to his credit, I suppose, took that thorny issue and others like it on. And that is what really has caused his popularity to sink to where it is now. Now, the interesting thing, again, should explain to people who don't understand French politics, and it is very complicated in terms of its system. But you may well find that come next weekend, we have a national rally right wing black government. Macron remains president. And he remains president for the next two years. Again, you listen to some of his allies. They are saying that what this is about, this election, partly, it's not necessarily him winning, but him being able to hold up to the French people and say, look, they've had two years of power and they've made a mess of it. I think the challenge there for him, we know, you know they're called populists for a reason. And apparently they've got this 28-year-old guy who's going to become prime minister, very charismatic. Don't ask me his name. Can't remember what it is. But he's surely just going to say, Joe, well, I can't do what I want to do as prime minister because Macron keeps blocking me. He's got a perfect yeah. excuse, hasn't he? Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's not very good. It's not very good for the rest of Europe um, mm. because, you know, what, and I know we're going to talk about America in a minute, but let us assume the worst happens and Trump gets re-elected in November. You've already got um, the sort of the disgruntlement about continuing to support Ukraine that will get stronger from uh, America under Trump. And you're getting that across Europe as well. At the same time as people on the closer borders to Russia saying, hang on a minute, we've got to step in, we've got to reinforce, while you've got the, the more sort of southern region saying, no, we don't need to keep spending our money sending there. So, I mean, I think we are going into a period as if we hadn't had enough of it. I think we are going to a period of a lot of turmoil. Um, and when you look to France and Germany as a sort of the linchpins, if you like, of stability in, in a peaceful post Second World War Europe. I mean, we saw what happened when Angela Merkel went. Germany's gone, you know, all over the shop. Um, and to a certain extent, what you've just said, Frank, about um, I think his name's Barolo, the uh, the young guy who's going to yes. possibly be yeah. prime minister. Um, you know, you've got that same thing with Schultz as as chancellor, and you've got you know the rest of the German Parliament. So nothing actually happens. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got Mark Rutte who's now taking over at NATO, the former Dutch um, 
leader, you know, who's a very good, very sensible person. You know, you've got all sorts of stuff going on around Europe. And I think it's going to be very difficult to get anything to move. Um, and there are things that need to move quite quickly, whether that's climate change, Ukraine, NATO, um, environment, you know, all those things. Not wishing to be alarmist, Jim, but I was listening to an historian over the weekend who said there was uh, an establishment and leadership in Germany back in the uh, late 20s, early 30s, who thought that they would be able to teach their people a lesson by putting a young man called Adolf Hitler in charge. And look how that ended up. And, uh, you know, history does have this habit of repeating itself. As I say, I don't want to be alarmist, but it is quite frightening when you listen to that backdrop that Joe has just explained very clearly to us. Ukraine, European Union, not at its most stable, and the economic situation that is facing everyone as far as I can see. You know, nobody's doing particularly well in terms of economic performance. Do you worry about what a national rally government might bring in france yes um the, i mean what, what happened in germany was that the nazis actually were lo, lo, in the immediate election before hitler was become made uh, chancellor they actually had fallen off a bit in the polls but the, the conventional right the sort of the prussian ruling class thought they could control him and gave him the job but that's yeah. that's rather irrelevant yeah. and no i i do worry about it and just just my my just parallel observation is that in a sense macron and farage have both done to the conventional center right party um similar things you know macron created this party in order to address these issues and he wasn't wrong to address these issues of the feather bedding of farmers and feather bedding of elderly people in France. You know, it needed to be tackled, but of course you immediately run into unpopularity. But he, informing his his own sort of party and his own image, he drew away uh, quite a lot of the old traditional goalists into his party and has sort of virtually destroyed that centre-right party in France. And of course in this country, we don't know how it's going to fall out yet, and we were discussing it earlier on, but it's potentially the centre-right party in this country is going to be destroyed. So Joe's quite right, and you're quite right, that all this is going to lead to a, a period of incoherence in the governance of Western Europe at a time when we want the exact opposite. Well, let's see what happens next weekend in France, but I don't see any positive outcome, to be fair. And as I say, businesses are sort of plaguing all your houses, whatever the result next week. So, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a torrent time as far as French politics are concerned. And that then knocks on to the whole of Europe, of course, and no doubt UK politics as well. But, you know, we can always rely on the Americans to show us how it's done and certainly in terms of television debates i mentioned the car crash debates that we had to endure in the uk well democrats were hiding behind the couch as the debate the head-to-head -head between joe biden its candidate and the republican candidate donald trump uh, sort of uh, unwinded last week joe did you watch that debate between biden and trump last week uh, no, I didn't. But I've, I've got an American friend staying with me who got up at two o'clock in the morning to watch it, couldn't bear to watch it, listened to it on the radio and was in tears, in desperation. Um, so I've seen the clips of it and it's dreadful um, and it's not an age thing. I know I've said this before and I've written about it in the blogs. It's not about age. You know, Joe Biden is younger than Paul McCartney. He's the same age as, you know, half the Rolling Stones. It's not about age, it's about, you know, his mental acuity and stuff. My dad, who died a couple of years ago, had Alzheimer's and dementia. And there was a point at which we had to hide the car keys because he would go and sit in the car and say he was going to drive to Cornwall. And the, the easiest way to deal with it was to say, yep, no, that's fine. As soon as I can find the car keys, we'll be off. And Jill Biden, who you referred to earlier as Lady Macbeth, actually, she needs to hide the car keys. But the Democrats have seen this coming. It's always been an issue. They should have been working on a successor since he was elected. 
Kamala Harris has been very disappointing by all accounts. There are a couple of people who are, I mean, I don't know American politics particularly well, but there are a couple of people who the Democrats think might be possible contenders. And Jim By uh, Joe Biden has the opportunity to create a successor because unlike in this country where the men or women in suits go and say it's time to stand down, only he or she can do it. Um, and, you know, the problem is that although Donald Trump was totally inco incoherent, as usual, and it's mm. very dangerous, he looked more energetic. Mm. And Americans like energy. I think yeah. it's terrible. Mm. They know Jim, it's we did uh, consider whether the reason why this debate has taken place so early, because usually these debates don't happen until the autumn, is because the Democrats wanted to sense check how Biden would perform. And it does give them time in the run up to their convention in August to perhaps change horses. But as Joe's just said, unless Biden voluntarily steps back from the position, then it's hellishly difficult for them to remove him. And Mrs. Biden, Lady Macbeth, as she's been referred to, not my uh, reference, by the way, picked that up from the media, but she was the one soon as that debate finished, you know, holding his hand up. That was great, Joe. I mean, I thought the optics of that were awful. It looked as though it was somebody who was actually putting their arms around a child almost. So I didn't think she did himself, she she did him or their campaign any favours. But nevertheless, she seems determined to try and hang on to the keys of the White House. Jim, it was, it was awful, wasn't it? You did watch the debate, I think. I certainly watched part of it. And it was an absolute car crash. The worst performance I've seen from anyone in any sort of leaders debate. Yes, it was, it was uh, quite distressing to watch in many ways. And the quality of the debate, rather like we've been talking about the quality of the debate between the leaders in this country, uh, reached some really, really bad lows. I mean, the two men really hate each other. And uh, when uh, Joe Biden got on to about when there was an attack on his son, Hunter, you know, there was visceral. And then they ended up talking about their golf handicaps, uh, you know, to yeah. people debating the leadership of the Western world. It was it was awful. Uh, yeah. I, I just want to push back on one idea that you've, you've floated, Frank, that uh, this was something that, that Biden was sort of talked into. My understanding is it's quite the opposite. Biden, uh, probably against the advice of the of his, of his close advisors, wanted an early attack on Trump uh, to expose him and uh, I think it, it, Joe Biden wanted this um, uh, but um, in terms of the difficulties of changing horses I mean I did address this in a blog a few weeks ago but the trouble is that all the delegates that are going to the August Democratic Convention are pledged to Joe Biden they yeah. can't apparently yeah. change you know there can't be a, a floor revolt in that sense yeah. um, then we get to the um, the question of whether in the event that he stood down would 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 there be consensus around one candidate because otherwise you've got a floor fight at the democratic convention and whilst you know the exercise of democracy might make great telly it's a hell of a gamble to have a floor fight where they have a multiple ballots uh, kamala harris obviously will regard herself i imagine as in pole position as the vice president but uh, we've alluded to her unpopularity which uh, escapes me but it's there um, and then you, you would have uh, Gretchen Wichmer from Michigan and uh, Newsom from California, the governors of those two states, presumably, and maybe uh, somebody else pitching in. And it would have to be decided on the floor of the convention. And then that person would have to be get to be got to be known by the American public in a, in very short order. It is possible that the very the very removal of this issue, because this is what I argued in my blog, is that the issue of Biden's competence is dragging the Democrats down. It might be that even after a divisive floor contest and a convention, if somebody emerges, you know, it might just work. But it's a heck of a gamble. But I think it's a less of a gamble now, Jim, because I can't see how the American people could elect Joe Biden. Uh, following that performance last week as I say it was an absolute car crash and he he was unable to remember what he was talking about and this, we're not talking about somebody who's making 20 minute presentations here we're talking about two three minute clips and Trump as you rightly say Joe uh, just his belligerent self didn't really say anything but didn't have to he was just able to stand back look as though he's fit and presidential if I can 
dare say that word when it comes to Trump, but it was to say from the Democrats' perspective, I think now far less of a gamble, whatever they do, because I can't see how Biden can win. Well, as the gentleman, or as you prefer to call him, that Pratt said, it's hard <laughs> to believe that this is the choice. <laughs> Are they, these two the best that you can come up with? A con man versus an old man is the yeah, name. Exactly, but I mean, it's it a bit is. like. You know, standing oh, outside yeah. a dodgy nightclub and there's two taxi drivers there. Well, which one, which car would you get in? Trump's or Biden? Neither. Yeah. You'd walk, probably. Yeah, yeah, but that's not yeah. an option. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting to see if the Democrats are able to persuade uh, President Biden to stand down. I, I understand that talks are taking place and they are trying to negotiate an exit for him. I think um, they're waiting for the opinion difficult. polls, Frank. You know, the, the opinion polls do take a few days to come out and uh, because I, I, I'm looking for, you know, him having sort of defied this car crash and carrying on. I'm I'm struggling to find what the next pinch point is which would force him to go. And the only one is in the next day or so, the publication of definitive polls on the American public. Uh, traditionally, these debates don't move the dial that much. But if there is a, a, a noticeable slump in democratic support, that might be the last opportunity uh, to get rid of him. There well, are a number of the... Would... Oh, sorry, Joe. Well, just quickly to say we were talking earlier about the influence of the newspapers in this country but the fact that the New York Times came out and it was from the editorial board I mean that is a really big deal it's a much bigger deal for them to do that in America than it would be for the Sun to back Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak or Nigel Farage and I think that will have um, exercised quite a lot of uh, thought amongst Democrats too. Yeah there are a number of high level donors as well jim as i understand it who are saying to the democrats unless you ditch joe then i'm afraid our money will be staying in our pockets so that might have an impact as well but uh yeah it was quite depressing actually because uh you know for the leading democracy in the world to have those two candidates on offer well not the not the best advert for um, democracy, I would suggest. And the person who will have been watching that with absolute glee, I think, will be uh, Vladimir Putin. But uh, there you go. There you go. Listen, I don't want to end on a depressing note. So let, let's just um, look at my news feed and see if anything is going on. I know, yes, Ed Davey is performing his latest stunt. <laughs> you can always rely on the Liberal Democrat leader to give you a smile even in the most depressing of conversations. And I think he's, it looks as though he's up on a bloody high wire or something today. Oh, so God. good luck. Good luck, Ed. I hope you survive until Thursday. And um, we're in the quarterfinals of the uh, And Euros we are in the quarterfinals of the Euros. We were very, very fortunate last night. But what a goal by Jude Bellingham. Fantastic. And uh, nice to hear an old Beatles tune. You know, we've got to have... Liverpool connected in some way to any English glory, haven't we? And it's the uh, old Beatles tune, Hey Jude, that is Bellingham's song that was blasting out from the stands last night, but only after a turgid 93 and a half minutes. The <laughs> last kick of the game. Jim, were you watching the match? Uh, no, I wasn't. I was at a murder trial, funnily enough. It's, yes, it's a thing touring the country. I can recommend it to people. Um, they, they bring these blow-up tents to these parks and then there's a judge and, and you sit around a table and you have to judge this murder trial. Uh, <laughs> but uh, It was probably more entertaining story. than that. Did you well, watch the yeah. match, Joe? Um, yes, I did. Well, you know, with one eye. I was in the pub and I was sort of watching it with one eye and just something, oh, this is really boring. And then it just went crazy and it was great. Yeah, it was like there was three minutes of entertainment yeah. within the whole sort of two hour programme, which, again, we go back to our leadership debates, I suppose. Um, listen, it's been great to talk to you. We are going to do a special podcast at the weekend. So do please tune in for that once all of the results are in. Uh, and I would urge you, as Joe did earlier, whichever party that you wish to vote for, wish to support, even if there is none at this moment in time, Drag yourself to the polls on Thursday. People did quite literally die for us to have the right to vote. So please do exercise your democratic right. And can I remind you, uh, because it may be the first time this has happened to many of you, you do need photo ID. So go to the polls. Don't forget your photo ID. Apparently during the local elections, 
wasn't that big a deal. Most people did remember their photo ID, apart from one, Boris Johnson. The guy yes. who introduced the legislation in the first place forgot. I thought we were going to idea. end up on an upbeat note. <laughs> talking about yeah, well, talking about prats and gobshites. There you go. We will close. We will close on that note. Enjoy the next few days and the lead up to the general election poll, guys. And I will see you at the weekend. That's it from us at the Downtown Den Politics Podcast. Thanks for listening. And as always, remember, don't do anything I wouldn't do.